Welcome, everybody, to the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil Huber, and today I'm joined by the usual cast of suspects, Logan Whitmer and John Doyle. Today is episode 28, and the topic of the day is, what kind of woodworker are you? We'll also take a look at a preview of the new issue of Woodsmith Magazine and the projects that we're working on for the next issue. Thanks for listening. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. All right. So like I said, the question of the day is, what kind of woodworker are you? I'm I'm reading the question to myself in my wife's voice to me. <laughs> what kind of woodworker are you? <laughs> so think about that. Go yeah. to your shop and think about that. Uh, <laughs> so. I ask it that way in my head every time I make a mistake. Yeah. Like who do you think you are? Yeah. Uh, so I see. I will also say that uh a former employee of Woodsmith asked me that several times when I would do lunchtime woodworking mm-hmm. as kind of a jab or a poke at people. But... Yeah. 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 This is kind of an yeah. interesting topic because the, you'll get on in your online groups in there and, you know, some people will be kind of judgy of like, you know, woodworking is this, if you do it this way, then you're not really a woodworker and, so it's, it's kind of an interesting question. So I don't know. Who, who wants to start or should I start? You're starting. I'm starting now? Okay. So I would say that I'm, I mean, there's like fine woodworking that I see like some of the craftsmen in the shop doing that's like fine woodworking. And then there's like, it's just fine woodworking. And I feel like there's a lot of times that I'm in that category where it's like, <laughs> I'm kind of limited. Wonder. Yeah. It's just fine woodworking. Like, you know, I'm kind of limited on time and resources a lot of times. So it's like when, when I'm building a project, I want to get it done. I want to do a really good job, but I also want to get it done in, in a timely manner because I feel if I lose momentum or get stalled or get frustrated that it's just not going to get done. So I find myself um, I would, uh, like using a lot of power tools. You know, I'm not in there with like the fine hand tools and really like honing you know stuff but i feel like i use power tools a lot to to work quickly and efficiently to get things done so i feel like the hand tool um aspect of my game is lacking at times you know i'll I'll do stuff with (laughs) hand tools but it's not like my main game you know right so but i feel like you know that's kind of my thing but then like i've been building this playhouse lately with you know, construction lumber, but I do find myself getting the router out and like doing uh, probably some, you know, a little finer details than is necessary on treated lumber. And so <laughs> there, there is there is some, you know, elements of perfectionism that, you know, that I have, but I find like, you know, I'm trying to just trying to get stuff done, you know, well to a certain extent, but not like overdoing it, I guess. So, right. That's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. Well, you've been but, known to uh, take things apart after the fact and redo them. Yes. So. Yes. There is a, like I said, a an element of perfectionism, but I feel I still watch like Steve Johnson or Mark, you know, working in the shop and just thinking I don't ever think I could take it to that level of detail. But I don't know. Maybe yeah. that's just me being critical of myself because there are things like you said that I'll you know, redo stuff that probably doesn't need to be redone or that nobody's ever going to see or, or that type of thing. So, but, so what about you guys? Well, I think part of me where this question is going and I think what I, I don't know, made me think about it more and more is uh, where I started with it, I guess I should say is what was the thing that got you into woodworking, you know, that would have been your, definition of this is the type of woodworker Mm. that i am okay you know that it's uh you know just for example that it's somebody who makes uh, cabinets for their house or Mm. 
you know, tables and dressers kind of a woodworker. Yeah. No, yeah, I feel like that's kind of been what's got me into the game a little bit is building more stuff for what we've needed in our house. You know, you're, you get your first house and you're limited on resources and stuff. And, and so you want to build stuff the way you like it. And I, I feel like that's kind of like cabinet work, like you said, or, you know, simple furniture or kids furniture. And so that more type of stuff than like intricate carvings and so more utility useful type things. So I guess one of the other things that made me think about it is I remember when um, <coughs> Logan, when you were hired, uh, mm -hmm. I wasn't in on many of the interviews with you at the time. So I always yeah, heard, so of, <laughs> heard it second and third hand. So it's like, yeah. hey, we're interviewing this young guy and he seems really excited and he builds all his furniture with just hand tools. That's super cool. That's something we don't have in the magazine. And what? I was like, okay. Yeah, I feel like we were you... way ever sold. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you guys. Yeah, I feel like I'm a disappointment now. No. no, he does use a lot more hand tools than probably what we're used to. Or traditionally yeah, a woodsmith. Know. Yeah, so I would I would classify myself in to, to borrow a term from um, the internet. Uh, I'm definitely a hybrid woodworker. I use hand tools for myself, so if I'm in my shop doing something, more than likely I'm using a hand tool, right? Um, because I enjoy it. That's kind of what feeds my woodworking soul, is using hand tools. Uh, but uh, if you ask my wife what type of woodworker I am, she would say a slow one. <laughs> um, because she has a long list of projects and she doesn't like that I do stuff for other people rather than her. I mean, not, and that, that sounds terrible. I hope she can't hear me because she's right through the door. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's like if I take a commission piece on, you know, obviously a commission piece I'm building, I'm not going to build that with all hand tools because I don't have any profit in that, right? Um, but I'm definitely a, a hybrid woodworker in the sense that I like to get projects done. I think I think in the scheme of everything, in the flow of lifespan of a project, you hit a point where you're like, I just want it done now, right? Like, I don't know that I've ever talked to somebody that was like, I absolutely loved this project and I'm so sad that it's done. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you always get to a point where you're like, I just want this stupid thing to get over with and get on to the next thing, you know? Um, so from that sense, I definitely use some power tools. So, so what, what type of woodworker am I? I am, I would, I would put myself in a hybrid woodworker category without one particular area of interest. Like I, I enjoy carving a lot. I enjoy turning a lot. I enjoy building furniture a lot. I enjoy building shop tools a lot. I enjoy, you know, um, metalworking and building hand tools a lot. So I don't think I could, you know, shoehorn myself into one category. I guess if, if somebody said, hey, you can only choose one type of woodworking to do the rest of your life, what would it be? I'd have a really hard time picking. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, I think as I as I age, I can see myself turning into more of a turner just for space and the ease of just getting in the shop for an hour to make something. Um, but that begs the question. It's in an, it's, it's an interesting question they asked Phil, because um, we have a, a, a article, this issue that we're working on, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a little bit, but it's written by a contributing writer who is a turner. And one of his lines in his copy he sent us was, you know, you woodworkers, it's like, wait, you're a turner. Doesn't that make you a woodworker or does it? <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's a real question. You know, it's like, I, I don't know how many people that are uh, very, very serious. I know some very good turners. I know some, some world-class turners. I don't think they could build a Queen Anne High Boy. You know, or I think they could, but I think they would have a harder time with it. Uh, so I guess... Uh, it's just an interesting question um, because we see woodworking from our standpoint, working in a magazine, 
right? A woodworking magazine. We see this whole wide world of woodworking. And I, I classify it all as woodworking, you know, right. where it's, there's different specialties, carving and turning and all that stuff. Um, but to me, it's all woodworking. But I think there's some other disciplines that don't necessarily, they see themselves as woodworkers, but in a specific field. Right. So, you know, I mean, and I, from my own personal projects, I, I guess I'm more of a, I don't want to say an opportune woodworker, but I, I'm not the type of guy that has to build something just to build it. Like I would love to build a Queen Anne high boy, but I have no need for it. So I'm not going to build one. You know what I mean? Right. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more of a, uh, if my wife wants a new bed, instead of going buying one from Thomas Mosier, who what's going to be, you know, $8,000 for a bed, I'm going to build a sleigh bed that's styled after theirs, you know? Shamelessly, shamelessly copied off of <laughs> Thomas Mosier. Inspired. <laughs> inspired by. It. Heavily yeah. inspired. I scaled everything. Um, Adapted you know, so by. I, I guess, yeah, so I guess I'm an opportune woodworker in the sense that if if we need something for the house, I'm going to weigh the I'm going to weigh the, the cost of me building it, the quality of me building it versus buying it and having somebody else build it. Um, you know, a, a set of cabinets I built for my wife's office downstairs. It, it was uh, through the people we got our cabinets from. It was going to be $8,000 for cabinets for her office. Mm -hmm. It's like, whew, I can't build it for one tenth that price. John would do it for half. Yep. But I would you know do I it. Would. Yeah, I would do it for, you know, I, material costs me a couple hundred bucks to do. So I guess I would class myself as an opportunity woodworker. There is stuff I do to feed my woodworking soul, hand tools and turning. Um, but that's that's where I would classify myself. Jack of all trades, master of zero. Right. Yeah. See, and I guess I would have, and when I started with woodworking and watching my dad and uh, I would have or I do consider myself early on as a woodworker as a furniture project woodworker like the project was the goal like to get the piece done and it was building stuff uh, for my place or mm -hmm. you know just because we had a need for it and I could do it myself rather than purchasing something so along those same lines. Over time, though, I've realized that, uh, and I would call myself, yeah, just a furniture maker because I like doing tables and uh, dressers and um, cabinets and that kind of, not like kitchen cabinets, but, you know, bookcases yeah. and yeah. nightstands and whatever. Um, but then over time, I think I've realized that I'm kind of a process woodworker I really, or an educational woodworker in the sense that I love the process of making something. Like the project, the finished project itself is still very important, but the learning about what it takes to build each piece, even though I technically know all the skills in it, it's like how to put those skills together to make this particular project is a lot of fun for me. So I enjoy the, the actual making of it. Um, and then, you know, early on, I think I probably would, you know, being a furniture maker, I tended to not to denigrate it, but just ignored things like some of the higher specialties or different specialties like inlay or marquetry or turning or carving just because that wasn't what I was into at the time. But, um, you know, I like doing carved pieces now, you know, probably more sculpted carving, you know, as opposed to, you know, high relief, acanthus leaf kind of stuff. You know, yeah. I like doing bowls and spoons and some of those kind of things is kind of is fun for me. So I would still call myself a kind of a general purpose woodworker making furniture with an interest in carving. You know, because I think there's also people that are 
uh, you know, we've thrown around the term, you know, like a maker who's mm-hmm. somebody who just has an interest in building stuff without necessarily having a specialty in a particular medium necessarily. Yeah. Which I, I agree with. I mean, and, and that's, you know, I think if I wasn't a woodworker, I would still be making something because I love the process of making stuff, right? My, my favorite, my favorite toys when I was younger, I still have them are Legos and an erector set, right? I love yep. just building stuff. And I love mm-hmm. following a step-by-step on building something, um, which, I mean, yeah, if, if, if woodworking wasn't what I did all the time, you know, I would be building something in some other sense, whether it's metal. You know, I love metalworking and, and welding and stuff like that. Um, or leatherworking, done some leatherwork. You know, just using your hands to make something. Mm-hmm. Right. In general. Um it's just one of those things. It's something I enjoy, something I've always known. So yeah, I would still, I would classify myself as a maker without a doubt. Um, I feel like that's a, a broad term that gets thrown around a lot and very loosely. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I, you know, it's if I can, when I say, you know, I look at a piece of furniture and decide whether I want to build it or just buy it, that that's not only, that not only goes for furniture, you know, it goes for anything around the house. Like, you know, hey, I'm going to put a patio in on my basement. Can I do that? Sure. Do right. I want to do that? No, <laughs> not really. Yeah. You know, I'd rather do other stuff. Um, but it's, you know, do I weigh that in my decision? Yeah, absolutely. So. Huh. Cool. So anyway, it was just kind of a way to think about woodworking and why we do what we do. And um how we see ourselves or maybe how we want other people to see us as woodworkers or people. So what do you guys think Chris Fitch sees himself as? <laughs> probably he's probably way humbler than the way like we see him. <laughs> like, he just <laughs> does something and is like, that was no big deal. That was no big deal. But we're like, wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> The fact that Chris can bandsaw something, bandsaw a curve, and then clean up the saw marks with 180 grit sandpaper instead of rasps is uh, is is kind of a symbol right there. So yep, yep. So in a behind the scenes sort of way with Woodsmith, particularly the magazine side, we're at a very interesting juncture here in the fact that. We're just a couple of weeks away from a deadline for a new issue, but we just had what I would call the current issue get out to subscribers and out on the newsstand. Mm -hmm. So public wise, all of our subscribers are seeing the new issue and it's one that we've been done with for at least a month Mm -hmm. and we're up to our armpits in the one that's about to be done. So, you know, for customer service questions, you know, people start calling in and asking about this, that, and the other thing from the last issue. And you got to kind of like rack your brain to figure out where we are and what they're talking about. And I almost feel like we have uh, publishing Alzheimer's Mm -hmm. in the sense that you write an article or build a project. And then as soon as you're done with it, it's out. You flush the brain, you do a mind wipe, and it's on to the next one. So to go back is sometimes a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, well, and especially when you tack on 40 years of projects. And somebody's like, hey, <laughs> you know that cherry nightstand you guys did? It's like, well, we've done 37 of them. So, <laughs> no, can you tell me a number? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Going to need you to be a little more specific. Yep. So the one that subscribers are just getting for people who are watching this on YouTube, you can see the cover of it is kind of a milestone issue for us. It's issue number 250. So uh, on the cover of it, uh, in a little bit of a backstory, is every 50th issue of the magazine, we've put a built a workbench for the magazine. And this one, we took a little bit of a departure and went with an English-style workbench. 
And these kind of workbenches, if you're not familiar with the English style, are uh, they have really wide aprons on the front and back. So it's usually kind of like a plank top bench with really wide aprons. You know, what are these, like 11 inches or something like that yeah. wide? Mm -hmm. um, and they usually have a row of dog holes across to help support long pieces. And then for work holding, it's dogs or hold fast and then just a, a, a big face vise. And the face vise is unusual because it basically looks like a leg vise turned 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? Yep. Yeah, for sure. And... Uh, this one's kind of cool. Dylan did it and has has some fun diagonal braces in it. So it's a really sturdy bench. I was kind of surprised at that. I'm surprised how heavy it is. Like, mm -hmm. not only have we we built the one, or Dylan built the one for the magazine, we built one for our, the TV show, which is kind of kind of odd that we are building a project on the show that literally was not published just yet when we built mm -hmm. it. Right. Uh, but we built one and moving that sucker around was like, holy cow. You know, it's, it's a fairly small bench, right? Like what yeah. you say, it's a fairly small bench in the world of workbenches, but it's got some, it's got some thighs on it. <laughs> it's thick. It's thick. <laughs> it's thick. It's, it's heavy. I mean, it's like, it took four of us to flip it upside down so I could install the vice on. Right. And I think what's funny to me is, like you said, it's a smaller bench, and typically yeah. most of the benches that we've built um, have tended to be on the larger size. You know, I think that they're usually at least, I think six. this one, this English bench, we did at six feet long, and that's probably one of the shorter ones we've ever done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All of the other ones, I think the ones that uh, Mark and Steve use are eight feet long, yep. and 36 inches wide for sure yep. and this english one is like i said only six feet long and 20 odd inches deep so it's not like you said it's not super big and the aprons and the plank top are only eight quarter material so you like you said i didn't expect it to be as as weighty as it really is yeah yeah i mean being a handful user and in the hand tool world, it's always it's drilled into your head. Like, you need to have a heavy bench so if you're planing or sawing, it doesn't move. Um, so I was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's an English style bench. It's smaller than a normal English bench. It's a lot of times English benches were 12 foot long, right? Right. Um, they were big, uh, but it's heavy. It ain't, it's not going to go anywhere. If you're having to push that hard against something, mm -hmm. your plane's dull. <laughs> <laughs> so. Other projects in there. So that was kind of our traditional one is to do the bench because it was one of our 50th issues. But then, Logan, you wrote the uh, the surprise project in that issue. Yeah, the boat. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. When I was told we were doing a boat, um, like, okay, you know, boat building is something I've been extremely interested in for a number of years. You know, being an outdoorsman, I grew up in boats. Always wanted to do. Yep, there we go with those two lovely models right there, Mark and myself. Right. Uh, I've always wanted to build a like a cedar strip canoe, and then that's kind of evolved into wanting to build a uh, like a center council uh, blue water boat, like a, a ocean boat. Sure. Um, it's, it's something I've kind of been playing with in my head for a while. Uh, so when when I was still we were doing a boat, and it was a flat bottom kind of like a you know, a puddle jumper pond boat kind of i was like okay let's see how this goes i think turned out so awesome yeah. like if if you would have looked at it when mark was building it you'd be like yeah that thing's, i don't want to say it's junk but it's plywood right it's plywood with a lot of epoxy and, and filler on it right like epoxy filler and stuff like that that thing is solid that thing hauls butt with a trolling motor mm -hmm. on it myself Chris and Mark were in it with a little 40 pound foot pound trolling motor. Uh, we were like, we had a wake behind us. It was awesome. <laughs> uh, and it was like, it, it's not an expensive project to build. I don't, I wouldn't say, I mean, it's two sheets of plywood 
handful of 16 or I guess eight foot, um, like number one pine right. boards. And the most expensive part of it is the epoxy. You need probably a gallon of epoxy. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably a hundred bucks in epoxy. Uh, but it, it turned out phenomenal. It was fun. I hope somebody builds it and we get pictures of it. Um, we spent the day shooting it down at uh, Todd, our uh, crib director. His mother-in-law has a small lake, very large pond that she owns um, that her late husband had built. Um, so we spent the day down there uh, taking photos. They were taking photos. I was fly fishing. It was phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> I did model for a few photos, uh, but um, yeah, it was it was blasted. It floated great with one person in it. I mean, it it rode perfectly level. You had about two inches out of the water on each end with just Mark in there. Uh, and then when I got in there with Mark, the the back end and the front end were just barely touching the water. I mean, it was it was awesome. So yeah, it was a fun project. I hope somebody builds it. I hope. A lot of people build it and hope they send us pictures because it was uh, it was very cool to see. Yeah, I I was, you know, when we were talking about the trying to get a boat in the issue because that's something people have requested uh, is trying not to make it too complex, mm-hmm. but then also not being too simple that it looks like a junky boat that you made yourself. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, and that that it's kind of what I was expecting was like a square. Plywood John is what I was, I was expecting. Wow. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's offensive. If it doesn't listen to this. Oh, man. <laughs> that's, know, uh, I mean, that's John's Zydeco band name, Plywood John Boat. <laughs> John Boat. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, because if you think about it, a boat is not terribly complicated, right? You could take it two sheets of plywood, screw them together with a little lip around the edge, and you'd have a square floating box that would basically i mean you could call it a boat right Mm -hmm. sure so it doesn't have to be terribly complicated but that thing actually turned out pretty elegant like it looks like you would see it rowing down a canal in you know venice you know it's it's pretty cool so yeah and i think somebody could really go crazy deck it out for fishing or um it almost it almost looks like a you guys in the western states will know what a drift boat is uh almost looks like a drift boat that you'd take down the river and fly fish off the, the bow. Um, yeah, but yeah, pretty cool. Fun yeah. techniques in it. Some scarfing, some big plywood sheets. So, yeah, no, I, I liked it because it had a nice graceful look to begin with. It wasn't real boxy looking, mm-hmm. but then like you said is, uh, it's, it's perfect on its own but it's ready to be modified or customized yeah. to the type of boating that, you know, you want to do, whether it's fishing or, you know, just kind of day tripping down a river or something like yep. that, or, you know, floating along kind of a, so yeah, I would love to see people customize that to try out all kinds of different things. Yeah. Well, and like I, like I said, we, you know, we had myself, Mark and Chris in there and I would say, between us and the trolling motor battery, we probably had close to 700 pounds in it. And it could have been drafting more than two inches of water. I mean, it was yeah. phenomenal. It's like, you really could throw in a cooler, a couple of kids, family, and, and go drifting down the river for the day. Mm-hmm. I mean, that would be awesome. So, yeah. Well, John's got all the kids this weekend, so... Yep, there you go. That's true. Put them, in, put them in the boat, send them down the river. <laughs> <laughs> they got the cooler in there. They're going to be fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just give them some sunscreen and stay hydrated. Yep. Exactly. But yeah, that was a fun project. Yeah. So other projects in this issue were uh, the wine rack that we did and some candle lanterns, which I thought were pretty cool too, as uh, accent pieces. Or I thought the photos on those candle lanterns turned out phenomenal. Yeah. We had our uh, we had um, one of our gardening photographers for our gardening title Garden Gate. He did the photos for those, and I was like, "Man, that's perfect!" Like, yeah, how he shot them just looked great. Um, you've already built two of them, right? Yep. 
So I've got two of those done for Christmas presents already. So, yep. And that's another one where it's a project that uh, simple can be pretty hard to do and execute yep. without it looking hacked. Yep. And those turned out pretty well. So, and then for this issue, I know uh, we're starting to get down to crunch time on it, but uh, one of the other editors and illustrator, Eric Loggy, just dropped off layouts for a kitchen cart that we're doing so if you can see on the youtubes uh, it's like a rolling kitchen island it's got some storage underneath and a big maple thick maple top it's like a kitchen workbench minus a vice yeah so, and i thought that one because it's got a like a combination of uh, white oak for the casework and then the maple top had a nice contrast to it. I thought played well together. Yeah, I can see that. I can see somebody building that one and painting the base on it. Sure. You know, like that would look really good with the, the green that we just did the uh, workbench companion on. Oh yeah. Um, you know, uh, it'd be cool. Miter construction on the case. I think uh, Mark was ready to throttle Dylan for right. miter construction. <laughs> yeah. Avoid <laughs> miters at all costs. He might be getting the mitered projects from Dylan, the, the <laughs> final turntable count console, yeah. and then that one. <laughs> He's like, seriously? <laughs> He's got it down though now. Yeah, yeah, trial by fire, man. So we that's what we call heat heat uh, heat treating yourself. You yeah, do it, get it done, you come out all the better. Right. So. So what other projects do we have? Uh, sander station that we're working on for storing hand power sanders, like a belt sander and a random yep. orbit sander. Um, bandsaw boxes, okay. is that the next? The bandsaw oh. boxes. Oh, and Logan's plane. My little bronze plane. So. Got the bronze one finally done. Yeah, the bronze. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I will say, after making both the, the bronze and the brass ones, uh, I think I like working with the bronze better because I feel like it bent and peened easier than the brass did. It was significantly harder to cut, though. Oh. So I think uh, if I was going to become a full-time toolmaker making these, which I'm not going to do, but if I was, I would probably figure out a way to mill those with a milling machine. Um, but, yeah, it turned out beautiful. I love it. I love those little planes. Cool. So that one, uh, we have bandsaw boxes, like John said. And a pie totally crust table. Spaced. Pie crust table, yeah, oh. that Steve Johnson did. Yeah. It's been done. It's been, I mean, it's been built for so long. Yeah. yeah it's been built yeah. for months now. Um, so, anyway, that'll be the, uh, that's the October, November issue, I believe, that that one will be out in. So, we'll be wrapping that one up at the beginning of August. Um, now speaking of hand planes, I've been working on my shoulder plane. I finally finished my journey through purgatory of sanding the body of that plane to try and get it to match the width of my plane blade. And then just the other day I did the cutting it to shape. So I went with kind of a swoopy, I don't know how you describe that shape for the, uh, for the brass body and then I'm doing wenge for the infill and kind of matching the shape and I want the the infill to stand stand on its own be a little proud of the brass instead of being perfectly flush like you typically see on an infill plane and I've kind of modeled it being inspired by the uh the veritas shoulder plane designs and also um Sauer and Steiner planes that I'm holding up a mm -hmm. sample of one of his I think it's his K3 line of shoulder planes his are really uh, extra curvy and it's got a fun look to it I didn't want to do a direct copy but more of a stylized version and my plane the blade is uh, 11 sixteenths wide so you could drop it into a Three quarter inch wide groove or a dado, and not have it bind to sure. level it and adjust the size of it. So, 
Mm -hmm. Um, Anyway, it's kind of fun to start to see it take shape. And uh, I love the look of Wenge and hate working with it. So it's a love-hate relationship because it wants to splinter like just by pointing at it. And yet uh, it takes such a fun polish. And then when you put oil on it and the, you know, the real straight grain and it gets a real uh, chocolatey brown black look to it. Mm -hmm. It's just a fun look. I feel like it's somehow distantly related to Douglas fir. Mm. Yeah, maybe, maybe. It's like, it's like the Douglas fir from South America. Right. It's from his I think, I think South America. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so <clears throat> trying to keep up momentum on that one. Yeah. How many belts, did, how many standing belts did you burn through? To get that uh, one. Well, and here's the funny part is I noticed that two things that I could tell that the belt was starting to go on it was yep. that the brass heated up really fast yep. and mm. two, the scratch pattern got much finer. Yeah. Mm. And I was using 80 grit belts cause I didn't really want to mess around. Yep. But, uh, so I had a belt on my belt sander and burned that one just about to emery cloth and then put another one on and use that one up until it was just heating up too fast and then started on a third one before I finally got down to um, the, the right width. Um, however, those last two belts, even though they weren't doing any much to the brass anymore, like they still felt sharp and pokey that I could use them on wood yet yeah. without really, you know, having too much of the performance degraded on it. I, I noticed that with this bronze plane, because these are the sole, I don't know if you can see on there, uh, the the sole and the, the sides are dovetailed together. Maybe we'll see one right there. Um, but you, you dovetail them and leave the dovetails proud, then you peen them, right? So you hit them with a hammer mm-hmm. Anvil and, and we mushroomed the heads. And I was thinking about Phil when I did that, so I was hitting him extra hard. And <laughs> <laughs> but no, I was uh, I was in my shop and I was like, I don't have time to sit here and file all these down. So I grabbed my belt sander and right. I, I thought about Phil because you were you were doing your your shoulder play in the same way. I found the same thing. I would hit my belt sander on the the peened over dovetails. And it would cut really well for about five, six seconds. And then that one area on the belt wouldn't cut anymore. Yeah. And then I'd scooch it over a little bit and it would cut great again. Mm. So it's like, it's almost like it, it took off like the really sharp grit on the sandpaper. Yeah. And then it just wouldn't bite. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I got through this one with one belt. Um, I did end up tearing the belt eventually. But, uh, but yeah, I was, I was thinking about you when, you when I was doing that because the, bra- the bronze heats up as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and if, if I was trying to hold that by hand like you were doing it, like, you know, that would get really hot really quickly. And that's what ended up taking so long on doing sanding down the body on mine is because I could only hold it against the, my edge sander for I would do like 30 seconds one way and then rotate it 180 so that I wasn't tapering it necessarily yeah. or trying mm-hmm. not to. And then after about a minute, it just got too warm to hold. And then I'd have to set it down and do something else. And yeah. so yeah. I wonder, too, if the peened areas of the metal are just got that much harder than the. Oh, than I'm the sure body it did. Yeah. So I'm sure that. Yeah, I'm sure it's did. harder to sand. And yeah. So. Yeah. I will say I might take a uh, note out of Phil's book and make a shoulder plane after these ones. After making these ones, I might do like a shoulder playing similar to what he's doing um with bronze because i have a little bit of bronze left um i li- i really liked the when you peened when i or when i peened over these the peened dovetails gave it a really like flint napped look oh sure uh, which was a really cool texture so i might see if i can play with that some somewhere somehow on a plane uh to see if i can get that texture to stay somewhere right so so, John, what else you got going? Oh, geez. Like you said, I got the kids this weekend, so <laughs> not a whole lot going on. No. 
Um, actually, uh, since when did I start on the playoffs? Was that like into May, early June? I felt like my shop was like in total like disarray, just sawdust, tools, wood everywhere. So I've been, I spent the last week or so going down through the layers and cleaning my shop and ready to start a new, making a new mess. So it's kind of what I've been concentrating on, I guess. So cool. Yeah. Fun. It's, it's amazing how quickly your shot just goes to hell. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, like I think two weeks ago, I told you guys, I, I was working on this bronze plane. I had just cleaned my shop from the, from the poker table. Just got it all clean, knew where everything was at. And I, I'd already started on the bronze plane, but all of a sudden I like really got into it. My shop is a disaster. It's, this thing fits in the palm of my hand. How yeah. did I make that big of freaking yeah. mess? Yeah. Like there's stuff all over. That's why it's I'm like, sitting on the deck right now. Because you get every single tool out and you don't put it away yeah. and just let it pile yeah. up. And so, yeah, yeah we you had to. I need to finish that anvil or that uh, vice stand that's in right. the studio because then I'd have a place for all those tools there that are go. currently just on my yep. bench. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we had tornado warnings and storms come through earlier this week. And I was talking to my brother in law. He's like, You got to get your cars in the garage. I was like, You haven't seen my garage. I don't think that's going to happen right now. <laughs> so that was kind of like where it kind of came to a head is like, Got to put everything away. So. You have everything in the garage that can get blown away. You got to leave right. the car out <laughs> sacrificially. Yeah, yeah. I'll sacrifice the cars for the tools. So, I will say, John, you you did a lot of work to get parts ready for our uh, bed we just built. Yeah, that was that was a workout too. It was like because it was all eight quarter ash that we started with, and some of the they sent uh, so it's two inches thick. There were some pieces like twelve inches wide, sixteen feet long. So it was like, yeah. I was sweating. <laughs> yeah, I will say it was some. It was some very nice ash, though. Like ash can get really weird. I, I'm like, I've done this. <laughs> no, you but like, it. I mean, I've I've been cutting a lot of it because that's what we are getting. You know, that's the trees that are getting taken around. So it's just right. too off of my place, um, and it, it kind of gets like blah, like oh, more ash. It's just it's just plain yeah. it's just not very good looking stuff mm -hmm. um it's not bad uh but the stuff we got from liberty looks pretty nice and yeah i was i was very happy with how the bed turned out you know yeah we always, we always get uniform to... grain and or yeah. I mean, it was good looking grain in it and yeah so. we always get to the end of one of those tv show projects it's like holy crap it came together again yes we're always <laughs> surprised yes <laughs> that's what kind of woodworkers we are we're surprised surprised when it, yeah when it works out in the end <laughs> well it's different when you're building something and somebody that talking to, I talked to a lot of people and it's like, look, building something in your shop or in a shop is significantly different than building it on camera. Mm -hmm. Right. Like oh, yeah. building it on camera is not really woodworking. That's right. more of like, it's a performance. I don't want to, it's a performance. It is. And it's one of those things. It's like, would I do any of the things that we like the steps and procedure we show is what we would do, but you would take without, a lot more time without the cussing and the sweat and the blood <laughs> and the throwing of tools, exactly. all, the, all the fun stuff that you would normally do in your own shop. <laughs> well, it's just not acceptable. And, Big well, hammers. Usually, yeah. Usually we have like a schedule, right? So we have like two or three days to get an episode shot, which we all know building that bed in our shops would take a lot longer. So there's a lot of times where it's like, yeah, if I was in my shop, I would sand this part down before I did that. But you know what? We have a dead blow mallet. Let's get it together. Yeah. You know, so but it's always fun talking to people that have never, uh, never seen the backside of it from the, you know, being on camera point of view. Yeah. It's good. And we like that bed, all the mortise and tenons will fit perfectly together. Then as soon as the cameras go on, it's like, how does this not fit anymore? This right. So. Yeah. That was the irritating part because we were glue yeah. trying to glue up the headboard and we had left one night having test fitted the joints mm -hmm. and everything was going to, and the plywood was dropping down right into the groove. Like yep. it was the, it was the ideal fit. Mm -hmm. And the next day we came in 
and it was like somebody swapped out all the plywood for plywood that was like a 32nd of an inch thicker. Yep. So. Well, that's how it goes. It never goes right when the cameras are on. (laughs) Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the Shop Notes podcast. Uh, if you'd, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review wherever you're listening to the podcast and uh, maybe even write a review, tell other woodworkers about it. Also, if you want to see what we've been talking about, a lot of times we're holding up projects and samples, things like that. Every one of the podcasts is on YouTube as well. There you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. And make sure you click the bell to get notified whenever we release new content, which happens at least once a week, if not more. Uh, Also love it if you're not a subscriber to Woodsmith Magazine to consider a subscription and even joining us for our Woodsmith Unlimited package. Uh, We'll see you next time. If you have any questions or comments about the show, you can email us. The address is woodsmith at woodsmith.com. See you next week, everybody. This episode of the Shop Notes Podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build. From furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects, and jigs, and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.